Aloha, good morning, and welcome to my first show on Think Tech Hawaii. It's called Stacy to the Rescue, <laughs> although I'm, I'm not doing any rescuing. Um, but I'm very honored today to have um, a very distinguished guest on my first show, Governor George Ariyoshi. Um, I also have John Koneko of the Hawaii Seafood Council and Dean Sinsui of the TV show Hawaii Goes Fishing. Um, this morning we're going to talk more about the expansion of the well, the proposed expansion of the Papahanao Mokuakea Monument um, and, and why uh, my guests think it's bad for Hawaii. So, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, let's, let's recap a little bit about this monument. So, uh, maybe John, you can just kind of give a really brief history of the monument and then we'll talk about why that's... A brief history of the monument, where it came from? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I think it's important for us to understand the uh, history of what is was about to take place and in the context of, of what's about to take place or might take place. There is an effort to um, uh, have and encourage the president, President Obama, to use the Antiquities Act to expand the current boundaries, the 50-mile boundaries in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands of the of the um, Papahanaumokuakea uh, Marine National Monument. So I'll call that the monument from here on out. And the mo uh, to expand the monument from 50 miles out to 200. And so the question is why would, uh, and I, I, why is it important to me? Well, I work, work uh, uh, as, as a program manager for the Hawaii Seafood Council. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. We work with Hawaii's responsible fisheries and the sustainable seafood that they produce and to try to make sure that the public understands where our seafood comes from and what does it take to produce it and who is managing it so that it stays within sustainable limits. And so the history is fishermen, longline fishermen came to the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council prior to 1991 with, to express concerns about potential interactions of the longline fishery with uh, monk seals and protected species inside of, of the current monument. So the, the request comes from fishermen concerned about conservation of nature. And it went through the council process, which is a science-based <coughs> public process, and it came up with not a 25-mile zone, but a 50-mile exclusion zone. So that exclusion zone was set up with a scientific assessment and a public process. And I think that that's uh, uh, where we need to start. Uh, how many years later, to the year 2000, that we have President Clinton using a San Marine Sanctuaries Act to create a marine national sanctuary on top of the 50 mile footprint that was originally um, created by the uh, public process and science basis. Uh, that created the Northwest Hawaiian Islands Coral Reef Sanctuary. And then how many years later, in the, uh, uh, 2006, we have President Bush come along and say, well, we're going to use the Antiquities Act this time and create a marine national monument on top of the original foot, footprint of 50 miles. And so those two executive actions were taken, taken, were taken to create new status for an exclusion zone that was already vetted by science and through a public process. Mm -hmm. And today's proposal that we're faced with is the very first time that a proposed executive order or action will would be to expand the monument boundaries from 50 up to 200 miles with no science justification mm -hmm. and no public process. So that's basically where we are today. Okay, all right. These are this is heavy stuff. This is going to affect everybody in Hawaii and beyond, right? So, um, Governor, um, can you tell me why, why you oppose the expansion? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I think uh, all people ought to understand and know that we are the only state in the country totally surrounded by water. Other states have other st uh, the next to the state next door. They can kind of reach over, flow over, do some things together. But we can't do anything like that with the other states. Well, we have the ocean. It separates us, and it's a very valuable asset to us. It, it makes us a, the kind of state that we are. So we can look at the ocean and look at the kind of thing we can do. I know, for example, we talk about aerospace. 
but aerospace is also water very much tighter, but not the land and the ocean. And I just feel very strongly that we ought not to have the federal government come in and set aside huge amounts of ocean that they, they have control over, and that we have to just come along and do whatever they want us to do. And I would rather want them to tell us that there are some things in the ocean that needs protection. And would the state go ahead and do whatever has to be done to protect the ocean? And we have done that. We have at Hanauma Bay, the marine sanctuary. We felt that the fishing ought to be protected. We did that. And I remember one time in Waikiki, when fish were, people were fishing out there, and they were overfishing, and the fishing stock started to go down. And we put a temporary ban on fishing until the supply got uh, uh, planished again. So I just feel very strongly that if there's something to be done, we in Hawaii can be the ones who can attempt to do it. And remember also that those who benefit from the ocean, those who get benefit from the doing things in the ocean, are the ones who are more likely wanting to do what is right to preserve and protect that marine environment. And so I, that's what I feel very strongly about, and I don't want them to come in and tell us that they can press a, uh, pass, pass a resolution for a long time, uh, not being able to tell us what it is that they want us to do. As a matter of fact, what was said to say that there's been no scientific basis for deciding, determining uh, what they did, uh, what they proposed to do. And I just feel it's very wrong. If the federal government steps in now and comes over, we don't know what's going to happen 15, 20 years from now. There might be an individual who might come in and want to do things in Hawaii that we feel may be very detrimental, bad for Hawaii, and maybe bad for America also. Because mm -hmm. um, actually, were you in office when the Magnuson-Stevens Act took place? You were, right? It was 1974. 76. Well, 76. 76, <coughs> Magnuson comes in. Was it the 76? 76. Yeah. Well, then, just to kind of let our, our audience know, the Magnuson Stevens Act is what created the, the eight Pacific, um, I'm sorry, the fisheries management councils that are all throughout the United States. And ours is, we call them Westpac, right? Um, and, and so they work with the scientists that you were mentioning and, and the fishermen as well, and the, so NOAA. Um, yeah, but I think it's very, um, very important that people know that, you know, you and Senator Akaka have come and spoke out against this. Um, one of the things that Senator Akaka mentioned is that it's, it's not a public pr or transparent process mm -hmm. either, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I appreciate. Well, I, I had nothing to do with fisheries industry. I don't have an interest in financial industry or anything like that. My only concern is that I want to see the supply being constant and that the fishermen have a chance to fish and bring the supplies to Hawaii. And there's been a lot of uh, misrepresentation about this. I've heard uh, uh, people from the state, uh, related to the state, talk about uh, how much of our fishing done by local people are being sent outside of Hawaii. You know, I go to that United Fisheries auction in the morning, I see all the fishes coming in, and they're mm -hmm. taking off the boat and come in, and Hawaii people buy that fish, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned also not about the, only about the availability or lack of availability, if the fishing is prohibited. But the price also, if they keep the uh, amount of fish that come into Hawaii, everybody has to bid for the price of fishing, mm -hmm. and the price goes up. And so I'm very concerned about availability and about the price uh, for those fishes. And it's really about food, yeah? You look yeah. at how much fish comes into the, yeah. the auction every day, yeah. somewhere between yeah. 25 to 50 tons. Right. Uh -huh. and you know, if you're going to replace that with something else, yeah. that's, there's a cost to that, too. Yeah. For example, a, a pound of beef takes 20 pounds of forage or grass, takes another two pounds of grain, just to create one pound of beef. Now, if you were to try and replace 30 tons of poke and sashimi, you know, you're looking at 60 to, uh, 600 to 700 tons of forage and grain. How much grass, how much pasture land does it take to produce one ton of forage? Right? Do we have that kind of land area? Do we have that kind of resources? And on top of that, we all say that the fishing is good for the bottles. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Some, fish is good for us. Eating more of right. and not right. be, uh, have it restricted on us. And for me, I'm 90 years old, so it's not my future, but I'm very concerned. No, but you must have been eating <laughs> fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's over 90 years old. <laughs> yeah, fish is good for the brain, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Kinds of uh -huh. things. 
You eat a lot of fish. That's why I you're eat smart. a lot of fish, and I we do we do tr you know my in my job as you know working with the with the fisheries and also the seafood is we try to promote it as a as a healthy well first tasty first it tastes good we don't eat because it's right. sustainable we eat because <laughs> it's good it's to yummy. eat <laughs> it tastes good but fortunately it's also good for us the omega-3 fatty acids for our brain function and our heart function, but also at the same time well managed through science-based management system, which means we are fishing within the, uh, the laws of this country that regulate not only fisheries for sustainability, but also our fishery impacts on protected species, mm -hmm. rain mammals, birds, and uh, uh, other protected species like sea turtles. So all of, in my line of work, I can't go out and make unsubstantiated statements about the sustainability or the safety of these products. Whatever I put forward is substantiated through studies or through some kind of a published document. And so the sustainability of this fishery and the performance of the management system here for this longline fishery, it is a model. We will hear, we will hear people say, this is the worst kind of fishing on earth or it is a model for sustainable fisheries. There's something wrong there <laughs> with those two different positions right. if they cannot communicate. So at some point, if you're not going to look at the laws in place and the assessments that are there, then I'm not quite sure that what, what we're arguing. And this has been quite an education for me, and I think for all, everyone involved in this, is that there is uh, uh, fisheries are not simple, they are complex, and fortunately, we have a system in place <coughs> to manage it. So mm -hmm. I think we have fisheries that we can be proud of, we can continue to support, and uh, they should not be vilified without any justification. Yeah, but, definitely. Yeah. I mean, in Japan, right, fishermen are revered right. because they're the ones that feed all of us. Um, well, in ancient Hawaii, Hawaiians, uh, Hawaiian fishermen used to have a very, very, you know, respected book place in society because they help feed people. And unfortunately, for some reason, all the commercial fishermen are being, like you said, vilified, you know, yeah. being accused of being greedy. But the fact is that commercial fishermen fish for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be getting ahi and big eye and that kind well, of thing. When you look at all of our uh, food source, most not the most, a lot of it comes from mainland outside. Yeah. And it takes a long time for it to get here. They gotta be refrigerated, and it's not fresh when they cut, get to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. The fishing, if it's done in our waters, come to Hawaii faster, in better condition, and we don't have to have it uh, treated. And the farther we push our fishermen to go out to fish, mm -hmm. the more time it's gonna take to bring them back the more time it's going to have to take to refrigerate and take care of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not going to be as fresh. And so, it's dangerous for yeah, them too. I, it feels important that we understand that the opportunity for our fishermen to fish in water that we currently fish makes it possible for us to receive fresh mm -hmm. uh, fish, better conditioned fish, than it would so if they had to go way outside or somebody else would bring it in. Absolutely. And the, and the we we the need the to be more self-sustaining. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Um, and let's, Governor, let's talk about uh, being self-sufficient um, and tourism. Like, how would this affect tourism? I mean, like, you're a very big picture, you've seen. And so a lot of people come to visit Hawaii, and the first thing they want to eat is Hawaii's fresh fish. Right. So, um... <laughs> yeah. It's very important in terms of our economy, because it's not only for us. For us, we want it because it's good for us, and we enjoy eating the fish. But for those who come and visit, they think Hawaii is an ocean state, and they feel that they can get good fish here, and they want to eat fish here in Hawaii. And I know I have many friends who come out and feel that way and eat fish here in Hawaii. Right. <coughs> yeah, I would re I support that. Uh, your, your sentiment there is that when we look at the primary business or ec economic driver of, of Hawaii being a visitor industry, People are coming not only for uh, the sun and the beach, but they need to have some cultural experience too. Mm -hmm. Culture is food right. for us. <laughs> and so it may not seem like it's that uh, uh, exotic, but to come and eat fresh <coughs> poke and mm -hmm. have it be real, the right. real deal and exactly. actually come from here and is poke something is, very significant. It's sweeping the nation. I right. mean, so a, a friend of mine just posted an yeah. Instagram <coughs> of poke in uh, Costco in Texas. 
Right. <laughs> you know, and so that's it's, our it's fish. it's taking off now, but unfortunately <laughs> it will take off on at the expense of our industry because so much of it will be imported and then sold as Hawaii fish. But when you come to Hawaii, you should be able to eat a local product. That oh. could be coffee, that could be mac nut, that could be what, papayas, that could be every, all the foods that we produce here should be consumed by our visitors. And I don't really under, <coughs> quite understand why uh, uh, sales to the mainland are something that we should be ashamed of. Mm, I mean, why right, are we that's good, that? right? I mean, it's, a, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's commerce. Mm. Visitors don't come to Hawaii because they're residents. They come because they're visitors. They come from outside <laughs> and they're bringing in currency. And for our foreign guests that are here are bringing in foreign exchange, which is a very, very big, important thing for us. And so I think for our primary economic drivers, need to look at what, what are we trying to support and what are our resources. Our resources mm -hmm. are a beautiful environment, but... Do we have land-based agriculture that's going to going to really make it? Mm -hmm. I, it will make it. We will try to, try to uh, diversify agriculture, but people do not come to Hawaii to eat beef or to eat right. wheat or corn. <laughs> they come here <laughs> right. to eat something that is unique to Hawaii, mm -hmm. and that would be we need to focus on not 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 so much on the land-based stuff. But uh, I mean, yes, it supports us, but we have to have. Uh, a uh, significant fishery to be able to operate. Right. I think exactly the point that's misunderstood right. also mm -hmm. is that the fish, the beneficiary, we're the beneficiaries of the fishing industry and they have some who have said uh, otherwise they're saying that oh we're not beneficiaries we send our fish out outside and our primary interest in fishing is to go out to sell it outside and they don't understand or sometimes they don't want to understand or misrepresent what the facts are to try to get a preserve like it's true, that the fishing is not a benefit to Hawaii locally, you know? And that's not really true. true You've indicated <laughs> tourism industry people who come and eat. A local resident wants to eat fresh fish from our backyard, which is our ocean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, we have to go to a break really quick, but okay. hold that thought and we will be back in a minute. Aloha, my name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kawilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's show. Sorry, she put no feedback. Hello, we're back with Stacy to the rescue. I'm Stacy Hayashi. Uh, this is the inaugural show. <laughs> we're talking about the proposed expansion to the Papahanao Mokuakea Monument um, and the detrimental effects to all of us in Hawaii, to our economy, jobs, food supply. Um, and we're here with Governor Ariyoshi and John Koneko of the Hawaii Seafood Council and De Dean Sensui of the TV show Hawaii Goes Fishing. Um, so what were we talking about before we went to the break? <laughs> well, high demand of fish, right? That's we've got, right. We've got all this fish coming into the auction, up to 100,000 pounds a day, and it's all taken up by, let's say, 80% of it is kept here, 20% of it's sent outside, but all of it's eaten, and as, as much as it's brought in, they still have to bring in fish from other sources to cover that demand. That's how much of a demand there is. And as much of it as is being caught, that only represents 2% of all the fish taken, all the big eye taken in the Pacific. So we could double the amount that we bring in and would have no effect, no detrimental effect on that fishery. Hmm. Let's talk about that because I, I heard that the, we're reaching the long line quota yeah. um, and then people are like, oh, they're so greedy, we're doing illegal things by getting the buying quota from other countries. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, I think I'll talk talking. about that because this is something that's very, very confusing to people. Uh, if you think about it, why do we, 
Well, first of all, quotas are set uh, by an international organization. Uh, two international uh, regional organizations that manage fisheries. So we have two different separate big eye quotas. It's the only species we have quotas on. So from my position, so every time we, you know, if we, if we uh, use up our quota or reach our quota, uh, is it a positive thing or a bad thing? Well, it's neither. It's what's happened is the reason we're reaching our quota early is because our catch rates of big eye have actually gone up, not down, and the average size of fish has gone up, not down. And so those two indicators, uh, harder to catch and smaller size classes, would indicate to fishery biologists that something is that there is stress and overfishing on the, on the tuna stocks. And what I'm saying is, this is an aberration. This is not a long-term set of data that we're going to look at in this particular conditions, the recent El Nino, that we benefit, others don't. That's one, one thing. But as far as the, um, you know, where, who's catching and, and, and what, I, I say that every time you have an American fisherman catching part of that big eye quota, that it is inherently better for the environment, better for <laughs> the species, because we have actual uh, compliance with the laws. That means sh data sharing. Now they are providing the information that is required to manage this fleet and manage the fishery in the Pacific. We're only 1.6% of the total big eye fishery in the Pacific, but we produce, for instance, over 80% of all of the, all of the third-party observer data on board fisher, fishing vessels that tells us what is happening out at sea, what is being caught, what is being discarded, and what is being retained. Those are the types of things where this fishery has, has exquisite and comprehensive management to the point where the oversight extends out to the boats. So we know with confidence what they are doing out there. Every time a foreign vessel does the same thing, I would question the management system and the fact that they're not playing by the rules. And until they provide us with the data and put observers on board to meet the letter of the law, as far as I'm concerned, they are part of the problem. I, you, you. So it, they may not be illegal. I'm not concerned quite so much about the illegal boats, but it's the ones that are under-reporting, oh. under, under document. They're legal, but they're not playing by the rules. Doesn't it seem like maybe we should have a bigger quota? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I argue that if you want a real market-based solution to overfishing the Pacific, take 1.6% that is following all of the rules and you don't get any quota reduction. Everybody else takes the quota reduction because you are not following the rules. Until you can demonstrate you're following all the rules, you will carry the brunt of the, of the quota reduction and give the American votes, the reward, and let everybody else catch up. Once they catch up and put the observers on board, start sharing data, do it, uh, the catch reporting, we move on to the next next thing to uh, solve. I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the true market-based so solution. who controls this quota? The quotas, they're, they're controlled by two different regional uh, fishery management organizations, multi-nations, uh, national organizations. The problem is, consensus-based management mm. as opposed to science-based management. Science-based management is where we come from under NOAA Fisheries and the Westpac Council. We have mandates and obligations to science, but once you deviate from science-based management, then you're going to consensus. Mm. If you have consensus-based management, every country has veto power. You will never get anything done. Mm. I see. Ah, interesting. Wow. Hey, Governor, do you remember during the war, they shut down all the fisheries because like 99% of the sampans were Japanese owned. Mm -hmm. And so the government seized all those boats and then they had to import canned stuff. I mean, can you That's share right. what that was like for That's Hawaii? Right. <laughs> we got greatly affected because of that. And that's why I think it's very important that the oceans be kept free so that the state can make a decision <clears throat> on what kind of fishermen, how fishing, how much, and if we feel that there's an overfishing and the supply is being demand, uh, going down, we can make that kind of decision and talk to the fishing. But that consultation will take place there with the state. And if you have somebody trying to watch in Washington, far away, making this decision, we're not going to be able to get 
the appropriate, the best kind of decisions that really impact us in the right kind of way. Because the people here know the resource That's right. best. Yeah, and the people who produce, who go out, not do the fishing, produce that fishing, are the ones who have more care most about cleaning up, perpetuating, and having a good fishing uh, environment. Yeah, because they have the most to lose. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Right. If you take too much today, you won't have anything left for tomorrow. I think that's pretty uh, common sense, right? Yeah. And that's why we have the rules in place. <laughs> and it should be noted that one of the myths that are being perpetuated is that Westpac is like the, the cheerleader for longline fisheries. And it's not, that's not the case. Westpac's duty by congressional mandate, if I'm not mistaken, is to ensure a sustainable fishery and to protect habitat among other things, correct? Right, to utilize the marine environment, marine fisheries <clears throat> for the benefit of the nation. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that uh, should be mentioned that back in 1976, not only did Magnus and Stevens Act create the eight regional councils, they were set up to decentralize the uh, uh, federal management process of, of federal fisheries in, in uh, federal waters. Um, but it also created and recognized the 200 mile limit. That's what it did. So prior to 76, we would have, I used to work in Alaska, foreign vessels were fishing right inside of, <laughs> inside a 200 mile limit of, right. of Alaska just saying, never <laughs> mind, we're gonna take your fish. Yeah, so that created the so we, easy. So we say, yes, let's accept the law of the sea, recognize countries 200 mile limit that 200 mile eez is an exclusive economic zone it is not an exclusive ecological zone mm. it's for us to for the benefit of the nation to uh, uh, to utilize and that that's our sovereign those are our sovereign waters mm -hmm. so the reality is our guys do a good job if you if uh, if uh, some i think there's uh, there's some confusion oh. Uh, are people seconds. who are who are promoting that they think that there is going to be conservation of nature in uh, coral reefs inside of 50 miles, mm -hmm. and there is no evidence that our fishery operating pelagic waters uh, are having any impact on the near shore resources, and protected resources of the existing monument within 50 miles today. Hmm. Wow. Very you interesting know, stuff. Uh, one other point. Oh. I get concerned <laughs> that. Uh, uh, <laughs> When we talk of preserves here, and there are groups in our community that are for or against it uh, mm -hmm. because of their standing. For example, there are some native Hawaiians feel that, oh, uh, they should save us all for the way they are for native Hawaiians. But I think we have to understand that we're one community, whether native Hawaiians or local other people, other people, we all must have the environment that will be best for all of us. And the environment that's best for all of us to keep things free so we in Hawaii can decide what kind of things we ought to be doing and what we should be stop, uh, stop others from doing. And to me, that's very important for local control, not somebody from the outside mm -hmm. telling them, telling us what could be and what should be here. And Absolutely. that's what everybody. So I don't want to see our community divided, those who are non-native Hawaiians feeling strongly about this, those who are native Hawaiians feeling maybe that it uh, should not be, uh, uh, we should stop it because of this. And, I, I just don't want to see us divided like that. I agree. Um, I was at the meeting last week with uh, the uh, both sides and I, I agree that it was very sad to see the divide. Um, and we ran out of time, but I just wanted to thank all of my guests for being on the show. It was very eye-opening. Governor Ariyoshi, John Kaneko, Dean Sensui, thank, thank you, you so us. much. Yes, and um, I guess if you guys want people to learn more about this issue um, for the opposing the expansion, um, go to their website, fishingmeansfood.com, and that's their the coalition. So, all right, this is Stacy Hayashi okay. signing off. <laughs> Thank you.